on both the abolition of our legal system and the cost benefit of our membership of the EU, I have great pleasure in introducing Michael Schrepp. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very kindly for the invitation. Uh, I, I prefer to say that my views are sensible rather than uh, controversial. Uh, they're only controversial because there's so many liberals about who disagree with them. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, no, it's very kind of you to invite me. It's a pleasure to be here in Winchester, the ancient capital of England. Uh, and when Winchester was the capital, I'm sure all men and women of Hampshire would agree that the country was much better regulated, yeah. save, save, of course, for the ovens. Now... <laughs> Uh, it's uh, the pleasure. To, I, I didn't realise Mark came from North Tyneside, which is where I started out this morning. So uh, forgive me. When I was asked for the coffee, I was gasping a bit by the time I got here because I had a very early start this morning. I was speaking at a conference. I presented a paper on Iraq yesterday at a conference in Durham, full of trendy lefty liberals and people from Jordan and all sorts of places in the Middle East. You can imagine uh, what fun we had there. And I arrived, caught the early morning flight from Newcastle down to. Southampton, a very famous airport, of course, from which the Spitfire first flew. That was Eastleigh, isn't it? Yes. First flight at the Spitfire in 1936, a wonderful aeroplane about which many stories can be told. Now, Mark and I, I think, last met at a dinner for the Freedom Association at HMS Belfast, did we not? Yes. What a wonderful venue. I entirely approve of that as a venue. We ought to have preserved more of our ships, ladies and gentlemen. It's outrageous that we never preserved one of our battleships. HMS Nelson would have been marvellous at Portsmouth. The Rodney that sank our community partner, the Hun, in 1941, the Bismarck. Something, you know, amazing that we give up our heritage so easily. Not a single British capital ship uh, preserved. Great mistake. Great mistake. Now, uh, I began to divide my speech into uh, three parts, but the last part I will seek your permission before I go on with it. I thought I'd do two boring bits first, two boring sections. Uh, the bits I've been asked to speak about, our legal system and uh, the cost-benefit analysis of you know, how much it costs us to stay inside the EU. And then when I've done the boring bits, I'll ask you whether you would like me to cover an interesting bit, but that would have to be covered under the Chatham House rule, uh, where you can listen to what I say and make use of what I tell you, uh, but you can't attribute it to me. In other words, <laughs> in other words, if you'd like me to answer the Chairman's question, which is why do our politicians sell us down the river in the way that they do, I can give you some of the answers, uh, but you can't attribute them to me uh, because people will only complain uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, in short, uh, I can give you some stuff that is sourced to intelligence agencies and my spooky, the spookier side of my work, uh, but we'd have to observe certain rules before we did it, including switching off uh, the camera and going into effectively a private, uh, a private session without the media. I, emphasize, I should emphasize that I'm not a spook. I just teach spooks. Uh, uh, my student, I have students in the National Security Agency, I mean, I CIA. I mean, I, uh, I teach online, it's, it's marvelous, but I have students in Baghdad. I get requests, you know, can I defer my paper 48 hours because I have to go into Iran to do a little bit of, you know, <laughs> 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 not nip across the frontier, do a little bit of work with uh, special forces, and then come back. So I, I, I do move in that world. Uh, it's one of the reasons why you may not have seen me so visible uh, in the last uh, five or six years, particularly since 9-11. Uh, national security uh, has virtually taken over uh, my uh, professional life. But I'm not a spy, I just represent spies, uh, teach spies, uh, bail them out of trouble, and do uh, intelligence uh, analysis. It'd be a bit silly drafting me in as a spy, because I'm a little bit visible, uh, <laughs> partly because partly I'm overweight, so I'd be no great success as a spy in a false wig, uh, even though I'm bald. Uh, 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 it, just, uh, it just wouldn't work. Uh, people sometimes say, why am I so open about the work that I do? Well, I, w when I initially started getting into this field, uh, the General Pinochet case, I mean, getting Pinochet back to Chile sort of made my name in this field, and he was a very nice chap, General Pinochet. The nicest dictator I've ever met. <laughs> and when, after that, you know, one, it, it did tend to make my name in, in, in that particular world. And, uh, uh, but initially, I kept that side of my life, uh, professional life, very, very quiet indeed. I've always national security. I've got to be, can't tell anybody I'm doing it. And I gave a speech in Washington after 9-11, uh, a synopsis of which went to the president with the CIA there and Mossad were there and NSA were there and you know, the interesting audience. It was under closed doors, the armed police on the door. And I thought this is all terribly, terribly you know, top secret. And I got back to England and somebody rang me up and said, great speech you gave in Washington the other day. <laughs> what, you, what speech? <laughs> Wasn't supposed to be in Washington. I was in, I was in Southampton. 
Uh, and he said, oh, I've just been reading a transcript of it on the internet. <laughs> After that, I gave it away. The, en the only people who know I don't work in the national security field are the people who can't manage, don't know what that uh, icon saying next is on Google. Uh, <laughs> only, only people who cannot get to page two of Google, if you put my name in Google, uh, are people who do not know that I work in that particular field. Uh, but let me do with the boring, deal with the boring bits first. I will ask you, ladies and gentlemen, because you may not want to hear uh, what's been going on behind the scenes. So if you, if you don't want me to go into the interesting bit, I'll be more than happy to leave my speech at the boring bits. But I'll ask you when I finish the boring bits um, uh, before we go into the Chatham House rules. Now, the first boring bit is the legal system. Now, this has been messed around with tremendously by the EU. The mechanism by which our legal system has been messed around with is the issue of so-called supremacy of community law. Now, if it was perfectly clear that our system was supreme and took precedence over community law, it wouldn't really matter. Because if we were able to override regulations and directives we did not like, then we would reserve a degree of parliamentary control, there would be some democracy and transparency in the system, and it wouldn't, the membership of the EU would not be so expensive, would not be so controversial. If it could clearly be seen to be democratic and subject to the ongoing control of Parliament, there would be no problem. Now, the EU understood this. Remember, the, the EU is not a liberal organisation. I mean, the idea first was dreamt up during the Nazi period, as you know, in 1939-40, the papers that were um, put together by the Reich Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Reichsbank under Dr. Funk. And any system that origin, has its origins in the Nazi German period uh, is hardly likely to be liberal. Now, the founding fathers of the EEC, including that notorious German spy Jean Monnet, uh, who worked for German intelligence for most of his life, uh, started off in the League of Nations, uh, where he was working for Germany, and uh, did a lot of money laundering. His main role in the last year of World War II was to launder about 400 million US dollars worth of funds out of Germany. Uh, he had been, uh, prior to that, he had been acquiring for the Germans in America not weapons, because no German, American weapon system ended up in the German uh, usage during World War II, but he was acquiring minerals, uh, particularly molybdenum uh, uh, minerals, which are essential to uh, manufacture of high-quality steel and armor plate, which the Germans did not have access to, which had to be bought in the United States. So Jean Monnet, uh, if you look his, up his, um, uh, his official CV, it will say he was in the United States during World War II, uh, where he was sort of uh, an arms dealer or... Uh, uh, a banker, uh, that all of that is uh, just complete cover. Uh, Monet was in fact the subject of FBI files from the time he arrived in the United States, uh, spent a great deal of time at the Abwehr head of station uh, in Mexico City. The Abwehr's largest overseas station was in Mexico City. Monet was tracked by the FBI down to uh, uh, Mexico City and he had regular meetings with the head of the Abwehr uh, for North America in Mexico City. And some of my contacts uh, who've confirmed this are former FBI officers. Uh, one was uh, well into his 80s, who'd actually been part of the team that was tracking uh, Jean Monnet. Uh, and Jean Monnet's files in the US intelligence uh, community make very interesting reading indeed. But Monet, founding father of the EEC, Monet understood that in order to make the whole thing work, you had to make community law supreme. Now, that's not what it says in the treaty. The Treaty of Rome only makes regulations supreme, and there are very few regulations. Now, there's nothing wrong in principle with a self-executing provision in a treaty. The EEC Treaty of Rome is not the first treaty to have it. By self-executing, I mean a treaty whose provisions automatically become law in the member state. If, within the constitutional framework, that self-executing provision is actually adopted. Now, interestingly, Italy, where the Treaty of Rome was signed, because Rome, as we all know, is in Italy, never actually formally amended the Italian constitution. So under the Italian constitution, community law was not supreme. That was decided in a case called Simenthal in the 1970s by the Italian Supreme Court, overruled then by the European Court of Justice. <laughs> in, a, in a country with a written constitution, you can amend the constitution to make treaty law self-executing. It's easy. No European state has done it except for Ireland. The British legal system has no provision for that because you can only make, incorporate treaty law into our own law by an act of parliament. But one act of parliament can't bind its successors. That's what parliament was told in 1971 and 72. 
Parliament was told in terms, if we sign this treaty, if we pass the European Communities Act, Parliament retains the power to override community law. And on that basis, Parliament uh, was fooled into enacting the European Communities Act. Big mistake. Ten years previously, the European Court had already said that community law was supreme and that the European Community was a new legal order, which is absolute rubbish. It was just an international treaty. There was nothing in the treaty about directives being self-executing, but in a case called Costa and Nell, the ECJ decided, ooh, directives are now self-executing, because it, otherwise the treaty won't work very effectively. What a load of nonsense. I, I, I can imagine the reaction of foreign ministry lawyers in the Netherlands and Belgium. They must have been horrified. And if you read, as I've done, the submissions of the Netherlands foreign ministry and the Costa case, I mean, they, they are van Genden loose. Another notorious judgment that developed this concept of supremacy of community law. They are horrified. I mean, this is completely contrary to all notions of international treaty-based law. Now, in a case called Factotame in 1988, a notorious case involving uh, Spanish fishing vessels, Factotame, in interestingly, was a shell company. The Factotame conspiracy, you want to call it. Very, very interesting episode. Factotame is a shell company that had at no stage ever filed accounts with Companies House. Which begs the question, since it had no assets and no income, how could it afford to take a test case all the way to the House of Lords and actually took six cases, or I think it was Factor Day number five, uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of legal costs. Who was paying for them? Factor Day was always a front for the Spanish government, because the Spanish government wanted uh, access by Spanish boats to British fishing waters. In Factor Day, the House of Lords purported to say that community law was supreme and said, Lord Bridge, oh, well, Parliament agreed that in 1972. That ignores two things. One, Parliament was told Parliament would remain sovereign, that future laws inconsistent with the European Communities Act would be given effect to by the judges, contrary to what the judges said in fact today. And secondly, there's a basic rule of international law, ladies and gentlemen, that when you sign a treaty, you are taken to know the manifest principles of the constitution of the state with whom you are engaging. So all the six knew when we joined the EEC that our law could not make community law supreme. It could only be done by an Act of Parliament. Act of Parliament couldn't bind next week's Parliament, let alone next year's. Therefore, when we entered the European Community Legal Order, we modified it. Because for the first time, a state which could not make community law supreme was now a member. And they knew that when they signed. That was the basis on which we entered. Every country that signs a treaty with Britain does so on the basis that Parliament can override the treaty because our parliament cannot be bound by its successors. Now, fact or tame, the government sold the pass, never argued it. Not at one stage did anybody from the Attorney General down ever say to the courts in fact or tame, hang on a minute, the British Constitution says we can't do this. It had already been decided. They were decided cases. This had happened before. A case called Colco in the 1950s, where somebody wanted to argue that Parliament in the Finance Act couldn't overrule an earlier Act of Parliament incorporating the Double Taxation Treaty with Ireland. What nonsense! You could overrule the Double Taxation Treaty with Ireland in the second schedule, in paragraph 16, subparagraph 4, subparagraph D of the Finance Act. Uh, it was the Finance Number no. 2 Act of 1955, terribly obscure piece of legislation. It postdated earlier legislation incorporating the Anglo-Irish Double Taxation Treaty. The later legislation took precedence. That's our law. Parliament cannot bind its successors. Only a metric martyr was it argued by me, uh, although I'm, I hesitate to blow my own trumpet, but nobody else will, so. <laughs> the, and, in, and in Thoburn, poor Steve Thoburn, as you know, died, uh, sadly, uh, very sadly died, great man, good man. Uh, in Steve Thoburn's case, we said, well, hang on a minute, fact tame is not binding. It's not part of our law, because the point wasn't argued. And the courts accepted that. And they accepted that the Weights and Measures Act of 1985 overruled the European Communities Act. Of, uh, uh, sorry, it was in conflict with the European metrication regulations. Why they'd ever persisted in metrication, you'd think they'd have uh, taken a hint from that Air Canada disaster. Did you know about the, the Winnipeg Air disaster? Ever heard about that? Unbelievable. Uh, the Canadians had tried this forced metrication, and the Canadian government, which was then run by a bunch of French liberals from Quebec, had insisted on Air Canada's brand new Boeing 767s being metric. Uh, 
we want metric airplanes. Because, you know, Canada's going metric. The only trouble was they didn't, nobody understood metric, and they didn't explain metric to the people who had to fuel the planes. And, of course, the planes being computerised, guaranteed, it, it failed to work, and the second plane delivered, the fuel gauge was inoperative. So they had to measure the amount of fuel in the tanks. But they couldn't convert the amount of fuel in the tanks, which was in litres, to pounds and kilograms, which was the weight. You have to convert, you, you fill the tanks in an aeroplane by volume, but the, all the gauges in the cockpit measure by weight. And in converting measurements in litres to kilograms to pounds, they ended up with the aeroplane having 40% of the fuel it needed. Effectively, they thought there were 2.2 kilograms in a pound, not 2.2 pounds in a kilogram. <laughs> <laughs> so the refuelers told the captain, you have 100,000 pounds worth of fuel. In fact, he only had 40,000 pounds worth of fuel. Result, and there's a wonderful movie that uh, very accurately portrays this, the plane is flying along and the engines stop. It tends to happen when you run out of fuel. <laughs> so we have a brand new, wide-bodied airliner, 40,000 feet, no petrol, no, no aviation fuel and the engines stop, and the lights in the cabin go off, the movie goes down, the lights go off, all the electricity goes, the instruments, which are all electronic, all disappear. So the captain's there, no engines, no instruments, no lights, and one passenger in the movie, it's an accurate, uh, uh, accurate reflection of what happened, turns to another passenger, well, they must have electricity in the cockpit, mustn't they? No, they didn't. Fortunately, the Boeing had a little ram air turbine and it dropped into the slipstream, there's a sort of emergency backup power. So he got his instruments back, but no engines. That meant he was a glider. And the plane is known in the aviation community as the Gimli Glider. And it would have crashed on the northern suburbs of Winnipeg, making a rather large dent in the northern suburbs of Winnipeg, killing everybody on board the plane, plus a few hundred people on the ground, probably, but for the fact that one of the air traffic controllers remembered, thanks to the grace of God, oh, there's a disused Royal Canadian Air Force runway at Gimli, about 10 miles short of Winnipeg. They were trying to make Winnipeg, and they were calculating how long can we stretch the glide. Uh-oh, we're seven miles short. What's under us? Winnipeg. Whoops. Fortunately, disused runway that was being used for a stock car race, and this plane lands on a disused runway with stock cars getting out of the way. <laughs> There's a jumbo jet trying to land on our runway. An unbelievable mess. And after that, the Canadians forgot metrication. Officially, Canada's still metric, but nobody, no, no more metric prosecutions in Canada after that. <laughs> Now, you'd think, you'd think that that would have given people a hint. Metrocation is a disaster. But no, they ended up prosecuting poor old Steve Thurban because he committed the criminal offence of selling a pound of bananas. Why they had to send in an undercover officer to see what he was selling his bananas, why, I don't know. He, as I said to the court, he was shouting out at the top of his voice, best bananas, 25 pence a pound. And they had to send in an undercover officer. <laughs> make careful note of this. I I'm not, kid you not, an undercover trading standards officer had to go and see what, what measurement system he was using to sell his bananas at, despite the fact he had a sign saying, best bananas, 25 pence a pound. It was a farce. But at least in Thoburn, we, the court said, you have to look to British law to decide what is the order of priority of Acts of Parliament. They then invented a new rule, the judges, which had never been heard of before, apart from, I think, one Oberdedictum about 20 years before, uh, never heard of before, uh, that uh, a constitutional act of parliament does, has to be expressly repealed, not impliedly. Well, with respect to the judges, that was not part of our law then, it's still not part of our law, and it, it may be that issue will uh, subsequently come to be tried in a future case. I don't think it will survive as good law. So that's the boring bit on uh, the law. Uh, European law is supreme according to the Europeans, it isn't in this country, uh, but the judges, with the greatest respect, have managed to get themselves into a slight pickle. First boring bit out of the way. Second boring bit, how much does this whole uh, 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 shebang cost the UK? Now, you will have seen, uh, I suspect, UKIP, I'm not a member of UKIP, as you probably know, I'm, I'm a conservative, this is an all-party all party conference, yep. uh, but I admire UKIP's work when it's, uh, uh, when it's done as well as Gerald Batten's, and Gerard Batten has done a very good uh, how much does the European Union cost Britain. And uh, the Bruges Group have participated in this work. And this is a fairly conventional figure uh, that the I Institute of Directors would broadly share. Cost to the UK, gross about £60 billion per annum, net about £50 billion. Well, yes, th th that's a reasonable effort to guess the costs, estimate the costs, 
of membership of the EU, about a billion pounds a week. The real figure, however, ladies and gentlemen, is three times higher at least. Now, who has been adding up the numbers? The Treasury have been adding up the numbers. Unbeknownst to Parliament and the public, after the Treasury sensibly said the single currency is a joke and isn't going to work, the Treasury realised, because there are some people in the Treasury with brains, I know that sounds odd, but there are people in the civil service with brains. And they actually use them in the Treasury. Because the Treasury have to pay the bills. I mean, the Treasury understand economics. Doesn't always, it's not always apparent, but they do. And the smart boys and girls in the Treasury, many of them quite young, sat down and said, well, hang on a minute, the number crunching we've just done for the single currency tells us that membership of the EU is also not working. So very secretly, the Treasury did its own cost-benefit analysis. And the figures they came up with were £150 billion sterling for the year ending, I think it was the tax year ending, 5th of April 2005. The current figure, because these costs are escalating, is around £175 billion a year, about £3.5 billion per week. That's for UK PLC. Now, the Treasury, of course, will deny that they have done this, but let me assure you those figures have been given to Gordon Brown. And I do speak to the Treasury, and I also speak to the US Treasury, and the British Treasury do not deny the figures I've just given you to me. One of the reasons they cannot deny to me, because they know they will not get away with it, because they have communicated those figures to the US Treasury, because, as Mark quite rightly said, when the war on terror came along, after 9-11, the Americans very properly offered to have a free trade area with the UK, and the US Treasury had also crunched the numbers, and they had come up with broadly similar numbers. And the British Treasury know that when I go to visit the US Treasury, I go into the Treasury Secretary's corridor, and I go and say hello to, you know, and my friends in the Treasury Secretary's corridor, and I get in to see, not the Treasury Secretary, but maybe number two or number three in the Treasury. Uh, and since I talk to the Americans, the British Treasury know they're not going to fob off any dodgy load of numbers on me. They can fob them off on the public, but they can't fob them off on people who can check with other governments what we're saying privately to them. Now, how do we get to £175 billion? I'm assuming that we're sort of going on to about quarter two? Yes, I Yeah. How do we get to £175 billion? Very, very quickly, the biggest single bill item in the bill is compliance. Now, compliance by industry and commerce with all the boring EEC regulations, 100,000 pages of them, is about £50 billion a year. That's industry uh, forcing you to change the exit signs, like the EU-approved exit signs we've got at the back of the hall. Um, uh, in one, some directives are costing industry £5 billion per directive. But the whole total cost of all the directives' compliance is about £50 billion a year. But that does not include the National Health Service or central and local government. The working time directive alone is costing the NHS, I think, about £5 billion a year. NHS, in, uh, national, not, not national, we don't have nationalised industries anymore, but uh, apart from the NHS, uh, NHS, central government and local government also have to comply with directives. And that's an increasingly large part of our economy. And 20, the, the cost there is reckoned to be about £25 billion a year. So that takes us to £75 billion, quid, which is a pretty expensive, you know, starts to get a pretty expensive bill for membership of this rather disastrous club. On top of that, you then add our direct contributions. You can, figure that you can look at the numbers in different ways, but it's about £10 billion a year. We get half of that back, but we get it spent on things we don't want to spend the money on. So the direct contributions are about £10 billion a year, uh, give or take a billion. Uh, you can work the figures a different way and say, well, it's only five because we get five back. So you can call it five, you can call it ten, who cares? Uh, uh, once we get figures into the hundred billion plus, the people of this country, once they understand that, are just going to say, forget this, this is a joke, we're off. Solve this for a game of soldiers, if you'll forgive my language. <laughs> the next item is the common agricultural policy. Jared Batten gives a figure of 15 billion a year, 15.6, I would go with that. 15 billion for the CF, CAP, about right. Uh, five, I, I reckon CFP, common fisheries policy, is about five billion. Jared says two and a half. I think it's probably knowing the fishing industry, I do fairly well. I was at sea with a fisherman in 97, went out to sea on the, the trawler from Peterhead, 10 days in the Atlantic. The common fisheries policy cost me a perfectly good dinner. Uh, 
<laughs> I mean, not, not, easy, not only do the EU, not only do, not only do we have to shell out three billion quid a week for the EU, and not only does it damage our standing in the world and interfere with our immigration policies and our foreign policy and our defence policy, um, and we have to put up with a whole bunch of Europeans that we, you know, very nice to see them as visitors, but not necessarily to stay, find translators for them, and they do their drink driving. I mean, it's a million pounds for Cambridge. Did you hear that last week? A million quid for Cambridge alone for interpreters. I'm prosecuting. I mean, it's it, it, unbelievable the number of drunk drivers we're getting from uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, but I better not say anything controversial. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't dream of doing that. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, I went out to see, and the, 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 the CFP cost me a perfectly good dinner. Why? Because we just battled through. Uh, uh, we were in four, It was November. It was winter. It was sort of storm force eight, seven... Six, seven, eight, it was a bit of a sea, and we'd sent the skipper had sensibly gone uh, to some quieter weather in the Atlantic, so we'd gone through the, the Pentland Firth, and we were out, and he'd had a radio message that there was some, uh, uh, some monkfish over on, the, you know, over on the other side of the Shetlands. So we go through the Pentland Firth, and we, you know, we're, we're, we've got a following sea behind us, so we're pretty comfortable going through. And then we suddenly find, oh, the monkfish have all gone. The trouble with fish, you don't understand this. Fish aren't very cooperative. <laughs> so you know, one skipper says, hey, we've got a load of monkfish here. We've got, some, we've got some space in our quota this month for some monkfish. Great, let's go get some monkfish. When we got there, the monkfish had all gone. They'd probably swum the other way, you see, while we were going, we were going the other way. Uh, so what we found was cod. Uh, but of course, we had to throw the cod back into the sea because our cod quota for that boat had been finished up for that month. So no cod quota, all we're catching is cod. And then we get a radio message, hey, the monkfish are now back east of the Shetlands. That result, 180 degree turn, do a Yui, and then go right through this force. Rum, rum. <laughs> that's, when, that's when I uh, uh, lost the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a nice dinner, too. I mean, the cook, you know, the, 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 they eat well on the fishing boats. And uh, I must say, I was a bit annoyed with the EU over that. But that was just a complete ludicrous farce, the CFP. I reckon it costs about £5 billion a year. Now, we then come on to, so if you're keeping a running total, uh, industry 50 billion, central local government about 25 billion, uh, direct contribution uh, uh, 10 billion, uh, CAP 15 billion, common fisheries policy 5, so that takes us up to about 85. Uh, we're now up to 105 billion quid. Defence. Uh, the EU are messing around with our defence, not only be losing soldiers, this is costing lives, because having to buy EU rubbish vehicles when we could buy cheaper ones from the Americans, armour protected vehicles and so on. Um, EU defence, being in the EU, is probably adding about £5 billion a year to the defence budget. Uh, we have to participate in daft, silly Euro programmes like the Eurofighter and the European Frigate. Um, and every time, as a friend of mine who's an air marshal says, look, every time we get into these European projects, the cost of the project goes up by the square of the number of countries involved. We could have developed the Eurofighter for half the cost. The Germans kept pushing up the costs because they kept changing the specs. It was the Germans who were doing it. And the Spanish, I mean, trying to build a plane with the Spanish, I mean, it was hopeless. Uh, so uh, uh, sticking with the EU, uh, uh, the, the, in practice, being in the EU, we have to develop weapon systems with the EU. It's forcing up the cost. It's about five billion pounds a year, give or take, give or take a billion quid. Uh, then we have got uh, the lost uh, customs duties. Now the Treasury really peeved about this. They reckon that being in the EU, all these booze cruisers, people coming in white vans from Calais, loaded to the top with you know personal consumption with a thousand litres of booze, and you know, having a party next week. Uh, the Treasury reckon they're losing about two and a half billion pounds a year in tobacco and alcohol duties. Yeah, give or take 500 million pounds, uh, but it's costing us roughly two and a half billion in lost duties. And then you add to that the lost customs duties that we would otherwise get from being in the EU. People forget that, but it's another probably about two and a half billion quid. Treasury would be at least five billion pound a year better off just from dues and um, uh, duties alone. And then we come, so we're already up to around 115 billion quid. Then we come along to the Human Rights Act. Now, this is not technically European community law, but since the European Human Rights Act has now been incorporated into the treaties indirectly, in practice, we have to stay in the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights for so long as we stay in the EU. In practice, the two are linked. And that's probably costing us about five billion quid a year. Pull out of the EU, scrap the Human Rights Act, bring back capital punishment, cut down the death rate. <laughs> um, and I did say I wouldn't be controversial. And... Uh, you know, we'd save ourselves five billion quid a year. Uh, 
We then come on to the, 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 the biggest, one of the biggest ticket items of, uh, of all, which follows on what David was saying, that is labour displacement. Hugely expensive. Uh, the number of European semi-skilled and unskilled workers in the EU, in Britain, is probably about 2.1 million. It was 850,000 before EU enlargement. That figure was fairly stable. People come, people go, about 850,000, French, Italians, Germans, and so on. Uh, we've added to that at least three quarters of a million legal, uh, self-employed, in inverted commas, uh, registered workers and so on. Uh, but on top of that, there are the illegals, and a lot of the Eastern Europeans are illegal, and they're not paying tax. That's about, probably about two million unskilled and semi-skilled EU workers in this country. It's all very well saying they're working, yes, but they're not all paying tax, especially the illegals are not paying tax, but more importantly, they are displacing British workers. And we have eight million economically inactive people in this country, and probably five million of those could work. And... Uh, the, uh, the Treasury having to fork out for each person that they're spending uh, welfare benefits, lost tax, it's about £25,000 a year. So the economic cost of having a British worker displaced who is not able to do work that a semi-skilled or unskilled European is doing, it's about £25,000 a year. It's housing benefit. It's not just the unemployment benefit. That's cheap. That's only two and a half grand a year. It's the housing benefit. It's the free prescriptions. It's the, it's the, the, the add-ons and the extras and the lost tax and national insurance contributions. It's about £25,000 a year. That's roughly costing us, in terms of labour displacement, about £50 billion. And the overall result of this, you add all the numbers up, and you get up to about £175 billion. Now... That's before we even get to the bill for climate change. The EU is completely sold on climate change because the EU knows all aimed at the Americans and, and us and, and the good guys. Climate change, one of the problems of climate change, ladies and gentlemen, you probably know if you've looked at the figures, um, there is a small technical flaw uh, with the UN's theory that man is uh, heating up the world and we're all going to fry. Uh, it's a small, tiny technical flaw in this theory. It's bollocks. <laughs> Mankind's contribution to CO2 is about 3%, about 3.225 to be precise. That's a 30th of the CO2 going to the atmosphere each year is coming from human activity. Whoops, it's a trace gas, it's less than a thousandth, it's about a third of a thousandth of a percent uh, of the atmosphere, and we're only contributing about a 30th of what the CO2 is getting. Most CO2 comes from the oceans. That's the largest store of CO2 on the planet. So how can we affect the climate with a 30th, a small increase in a 30th, of a trace gas. It's nonsense. Global warming gases, yes, of course, there are greenhouse gases. The greenhouse effect is very important. That's why we're able to live, even though we're in the EU. But it, <laughs> the most important trace gas by about 95% is water vapour. CO2's contribution to the greenhouse gas is about 2 or 3%. The whole thing is a complete screaming farce. The UN know it's a farce. It's a fraud. If you talk to people like Crispin Tickle, I'd advise against it. But if you talk to people like Crispin Tickle, who've been pushing this nonsense for nearly 20 years, they know it's nonsense. It's all been done to stiff the Western economies. The Chinese don't pay any attention to it because they know the figures, are, they know the UN's books are cooked. But the EU has sold itself on this nonsense. So if we stay in the EU, we're going to find ourselves contributing hundreds of billions of pounds a year to the totally unnecessary cost of dealing with climate change. Now, I'm in the hands of the chairman because I've dealt now with the boring bits. Basically, uh, cost, e membership of the EU costs us about ballpark, give or take, £10 million a year. What's £10 million amongst friends? Uh, and I know you're in UKIP, but, but many of you are in UKIP, but you're still friends. <laughs> What's £10 billion a year, plus or minus, amongst friends? It's costing us roughly £175 billion a year for 2007. Uh, that's the financial year ending April 5th, 2007. Uh, for next year, they'll probably go up by, it's going up by 2 or 3% a year uh, to stay in the EU. UK PLC, better off by over £3 billion a week uh, when we pull out. We won't see the benefits straight away. There will have to be transitional period. It will take two years probably to get rid of all the EU regulations to change all the signs back. Uh, so we will not see that straight away. But after a two-year transitional period, we should be getting the benefit uh, of around £3.5 billion a week. Uh, what do we do as an alternative to the EU? Obviously, we should leave. 
uh, do a free trade deal with the Americans. NAFTA is the world's largest trading area. We should join the free trade area without joining NAFTA, which is a silly treaty which the Americans now realize is a mistake. Uh, you talk to American policymakers, and I do, I visited the White House, for example. Uh, how would you guys like to swap Mexico for us? Yes, please. Okay? <laughs> Republicans <laughs> do. Republicans will do you a deal tomorrow that will swap Mexico for us in NAFTA. We can have a free trade deal with Mexico if we want. No, nothing against the Mexicans, nice people. Uh, if you want to import sombreros and uh, Mexican food and so on, we can do that. Uh, Mexico in, Mexico out, doesn't make a difference. We can do a free trade deal with the United States and Canada. We can also rejoin EFTA, which has a higher GDP per capita than the EU. And we could bring back slowly Commonwealth preference. We can't call it imperial preference because it will upset the UN. Uh, but uh, we could bring back slowly uh, free trade deals with our major trading partners in the Commonwealth. The EU costs us about £30 billion a year draining sterling out of the country because we have a massive deficit with the EU, huge surplus with the Americans. We will be able to drop interest rates outside the EU, I reckon, by at least a point, just reflecting the trade imbalance. And you can add to that another half a point reflecting the currency that's going out of the country uh, being <coughs> remitted funds by immigrants. Stop the drain of sterling out of the country drop interest rates, uh, and give the economy a huge boost. Now, gentlemen, that's the end of the boring bits. Uh, we probably have run out of time to do the exciting bit. Uh, would you like five minutes of exciting bit, or would you prefer to come back and have lunch? I'm sure I, I'm sure I speak to you all if I say that we want him to carry on. Is this the point at which we ask... Yes, exactly. We exactly. ask the gentleman to... Uh, yes, I will. Yes. You can... 20, 25 years, I think you'll find all of what I've told you is going to emerge, but it's going to emerge dribs and drabs, uh, you've had it in one sort of lump sum this morning. But there will be instalments in the newspapers in years to come. Um, Thank you very much. Can we just say that we live in the village the road, where Ian Gow was yeah. burned, yeah. and we heard the bomb going. Mr. Chairman, the camera that I used to sit on. It was such a large thing. All these people that you have mentioned are all like minded. Who have anti European tendencies. Now, why should they be picked on? Mm. <laughs> uh, which, which, uh, sorry, why should. Ian Gow was very. Yeah, Ian, Ian Gow, Ian Gow was a. Uh, I, I agree with you, from those who met him, I never met him, but I know people who didn't him very well. He was a lovely guy, of course. Ian Gow, and uh, we may have, might be a question to put to Christopher Gill probably, because Christopher knew him very well, was on the, you know, in the Parliament with Ian at the time. Ian was a critical supplier of political intelligence to Margaret Thatcher. Ian was Margaret's eyes and ears, and I see you nodding, on the Tory party benches. Now, in order to remove Margaret in November, it was concluded that it would have to be, it was necessary to remove Ian first. That is why he was murdered at the time that he was. Now, what was, what was done, and you heard the explosion, uh, you were there when he was murdered. He was with an earshot. What was done was absolutely disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. What I'm explaining is the reason why. Yeah, because I'm, I'm being very a little bit cautious of what I'm saying on the camera. But, but what was done was disgraceful. What I've tried to explain to you is why. Things happen for a reason. Ian Gow was murdered for a reason. He wasn't chosen at random. He wasn't murdered just because he was a conservative. With Ian McLeod, the McLeod murder happened not because Ian McLeod was against the EC entry. Ian was in favour of EC entry. The point is that Ian was in favour of EC entry because he genuinely thought it was good for Britain, and he had been briefed in by his officials that the terms on which Heath was proposing to take us in were ruinous. In short, Ian McLeod favoured EC entry, but on more favourable terms. For example, they were fishing and agriculture. So the position there is not, are you in favour of easy entry? He was. He was in favour of easy entry on much more generous terms to Britain, which he correctly concluded we would get, because he understood, as did the Treasury, that the balance of economic advantage lay not with Britain, but with the EEC. That is why uh, he was so very disgracefully murdered in 1970. And again, I didn't know Ian, but Ian was... Uh, I knew people who knew Ian McLeod very well. I actually a little bit closer perhaps than you might think uh, to some of these events. I, I think that what, what we have done here is allowed this session to go on until now, yes, quarter past one. Uh, we were due to finish at 12.30.
No, I, no not at all. Uh, I think everybody has appreciated listening to you, Michael. And I think it's, a, it's such an important subject, but, and I think everybody is, is uh, thankful that uh, they've had the opportunity of at least hearing you. Uh, that, I, I think it's always wise to allow something to carry on if it's of great interest. Now, I think there is a limit, and I really don't want to now open it to further questions. What I'm going to do now is to say to you that it could have just gone quarter past one. I know that people have already left to change their car positions uh, because of what I said earlier. But I'm now going to suggest that we curtail lunch from one hour to, say, 40 minutes.